In this module, we talked about sexual violence. Although sexual violence is a broad term that encompasses a diversity of different offenses, in all circumstances, sexual violence is a crime and outwardly viewed as unacceptable within the context of our culture. However, some scholars have argued that in many ways, the United States ignores, trivializes, and normalizes sexual violence. Some have even suggested we live in a rape culture, which is a culture in which rape is so widespread and viewed with such minimal criticism that it's normalized. The term sexual violence is an all-encompassing and non-legal term that refers to crimes such as sexual assault, rape, and sexual abuse. The legal definitions of crimes can vary from state to state, and research has shown that there's often other crimes and forms of violence that jointly arise with crimes like sexual assault. According to the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, instances of rape, child sexual abuse, dating and domestic violence, drug-facilitated sexual assaults, hate crimes, incest, male sexual violence, sexual exploitation, sexual harassment, and stalking are all part of the umbrella of sexual violence. However, sexual violence is much more expansive than just these particular crimes and can also include things such as human trafficking, female genital cutting, as well as child marriage. Scholars often find it challenging to define sexual violence, given the variation in the ways in which different groups of people define both sex and violence. One of the first academic definitions of sexual violence emerged in the late 1980s when Liz Kelly defined sexual violence as any physical, visual, verbal, or sexual act that's experienced by the woman or girl at that time or later as a threat, invasion, or assault that has the effect of hurting her and or takes away her ability to control intimate contact. This definition was revolutionary in that it viewed sexual violence not just as a physical act, but something that could also be visual, verbal, or sexual in nature, and the fact that it highlighted that the impact of this event could occur at the time or later, ultimately taking away control for intimate contact. However, there are clearly limitations to Liz Kelly's definition, specifically the fact that she focuses on women and girls, ignoring the fact that women, girls, men, boys, and those beyond the binary can all be victims of sexual violence. To further explore the complications of defining sexual violence, we looked at the case of the Kung people from the Kalahari Desert. In this particular culture, children engage in a heterosexual play where young boys force themselves upon young girls. However, members of the community do not view this as particularly problematic. In part, scholars question if it's because the Kung people of this region have very few sexual taboos. While they think it's not necessarily a positive thing for children to engage in this kind of play and do not encourage it, they don't necessarily view it as incredibly problematic. As mentioned earlier, one of the challenges in addressing sexual violence today is the minimal exposure that we give to male sexual victimization. Research has shown that approximately one in four men in the United States has experienced some form of contact sexual violence. Contact sexual violence is a fairly broad phrase that can include rape or being uh, the victim of penetration, but also includes being forced to penetrate another or being forced to engage in sexual interaction or unwanted sexual contact via coercion or physical force. There are two areas of study that have further explored male sexual victimization. 
the first is within the context of the prison system, and the second is within the context of war and conflict. Research about sexual violence in prison systems shows the challenges that inmates face as victims of sexual violence. More recently, scholars have begun to look at the way in which men experience sexual violence during war and conflict, suggesting it's not just women who face forms of sexual victimization during conflict situations. We also discussed cultural practices, which from our Western point of view can be seen as sexual violence. Specifically, we talked about the Sambia of Papua New Guinea, who engage in a coming of age ritual where boys between seven and 10 have to perform fellatio on older youth and young men as a means of ingesting semen, which the men believe helps them to grow brave, strong, and ultimately masculine. Although many young boys initially resist engaging in this practice, the Sambia believe it's necessary for young boys to ingest semen by performing fellatio as a mechanism to become fully masculine, brave, and strong adult men. The readings for this week further explored issues of sexual violence. In working out a yes, Peggy Sandy found that fraternity brothers in her study thought of working out a yes or using any means necessary to get a woman to engage in sexual contact was an act of seduction rather than an act of sexual violence. Sandy argued that working out a yes reinforced heterosexuality and masculinity among young men living in a homosocial environment. Ultimately, she believed these ideologies legitimated male dominance and violence against women. In a qualitative study exploring child marriage practices among Syrian conflict-affected populations in Lebanon, the authors looked at the various factors that promoted child marriage practices among Syrian refugees, as well as how to address these factors in trying to decrease the number of child marriages. The authors found that within refugee populations, concerns about safety, feelings of insecurity, worsening economic conditions, and disruption in the education of young women all increased child marriage. Ultimately, the authors argued that decisions about child marriage intervention need to involve multiple stakeholders, including members of the refugee community, and they needed to be delivered in a culturally sensitive and practical manner. In your final thoughts for this week, I'd like you to think about what the biggest challenges are in addressing sexual violence in our culture today. What role do you think social institutions and social forces play in creating these obstacles? And how might a sociological lens allow us to better address the issue of sexual violence in our society today?